Welcome to Mastering Life's Adventures, an educational podcast about tapping into your true self, the soul, your soul, the substance of your life, to discover what life's ups and downs are really about, and how to have a greater sense of purpose, peace, joy, and fulfillment. I am Dr. Judith Holder, your host, coach, psychologist, fellow seeker who enjoys diving into the connections between spirituality, psychology, wellness, and your everyday life's adventures, all preparing and polishing you like the facets of a magnificent diamond to be your best self. If you're craving more from your life, you are in the right place. Come, let's journey together and transforming what you know into who you really are. Mastering Life's Adventures begins now. Hi, I'm back. And I'm back for a discussion in this segment of Real Life Adventures and exploring movies and how they relate to soul evolution. I'm here with Christy, a connoisseur of movies, to discuss It's a Wonderful Life by James Stewart. And this movie is rich with lessons and so relatable to our experiences back then and even here now in the 21st century. Figuratively speaking or in real life, we can learn something from this movie as we move into 2024 and look at how we want our life to go and also reflect on how our life has been. As we've moved through our lives, you think about some of the things or the lessons that we may be highlighting that would uh, help you to think about this from a soul's perspective. So let me ask Christy begin and talking about the movie, and then we're going to be diving into some of the lessons that are really nicely learned through this movie and how we can maybe even apply it moving forward in 2024. I'd like to start off with talking about George Bailey as a child. Basically, he was a giver. He loved helping other people, even to the fact that he would jeopardized himself to help others, such as his brother, when he would fell through the ice sledding. Instead of trying to u- use his hand to pull him out of the water, he jumped in himself and ended up becoming ill and losing the hearing in his left ear. To the fact that also where he worked at the pharmacy, when the pharmacist put the wrong pills in the bag for another sick child, George tried to find a way not to be able to give those pills and to protect him by running around asking other people to help and, or find, figure out what to do. When he went back to the pharmacist, the pharmacist was not himself because he was mourning because he lost his son. And so George took the brunt of his, his grief with that, with that left ear, because the, the pharmacist really boxed his ears. But he still continued on, but it kept him out of a lot of things. He couldn't get it when he grew up. He couldn't get into the military because he couldn't he- hear out of one ear. But he was a dreamer also. He wanted to do things. He wanted to go places. He was not really satisfied with his life in Bedford Falls. He wanted more. And we kind of have, that seems to be the human condition these days of of wanting more than what we we have. All the grass is always greener on the other side. I would add to that. I think, you know, and from a soul perspective, the soul always has this urge of wanting to do something more. The soul always wants to be able to explore or to be able to garner certain knowledge or learn something more and not feel boxed in in some ways, or not feel like it's in a prison, that it's only one particular way that you need to do something, but are there other ways that we can open ourselves out and explore as a great adventure in our lives? This is what uh, George wanted to be able to do, but life happens, you know, and in that process of life happening, because he was so much a service, a giving of service of himself, not thinking about himself, even though he had these desires on the side that he wanted to do, something keep on always coming up that pushed him to look at helping others. Well, Potter was his, who was his nemesis. He was the total opposite. He was the wealthiest man in town. He owned everything and he wanted to, he wanted to own the, the savings and loans. 
And George didn't want that because he wanted the people to be able to own their own instead of relying on the bank to pay for everything. I mean, Potter was really adamant. He wanted that. He wanted it gone. He wanted everything. And George was standing in his way. So he did whatever he had to do to get George out of the way. And his uncle was not helping because his uncle was, I think his uncle was grieving too when he lost his brother. When his brother died, everything fell on George. His uncle was not strong enough to stand to help him. So he was more of a hindrance than, than a help. And that, Which was George's father who passed. Yes. And so that, in some ways, George kind of resisted having to run the bank because he still had these dreams that he wanted. And that's sometimes what we have to be attuned to the fact that at a soul level, we may have certain desires, but life and our divine plan may put us in a different direction. And we have to be able to think about how to reconcile that and to be able to see the higher good or the higher blessings that we're giving to others also, in, indirectly, it becomes a blessing to ourselves. So it took his college money. Then again, here comes the kind heart, the loving heart. He took his college money that he was planning to go to school on and gave it to his brother and sent his brother to school. Sent his brother to go out into the world and make his way. Sent his brother to, to find a girl outside of Bedford Falls. And allowed his brother to go to war and become a hero of things that he wanted to do himself, to see the world. You you could see that that kind heart would stay. He, even though he was not able to do the things that he wanted to do, it did not embitter him. He decided to stand up and say, okay, this is my lot in life. This is what I need to do. Okay, if I leave, this will crumble. And these people will suffer because I left. But if my brother leaves, ah, he can, he'll, everything will be fine because I can handle this. And so he gave his brother the opportunity to do something else and to get out. Yeah, she, he did. He, he indirectly, by taking on the responsibilities, uh, because he was the oldest, it uh, meant also then he sacrificed in many regards. He surrendered in some ways. And not totally, though. Hmm, not, not totally. totally. That's correct. He did not. He still had that desire, but he surrendered enough to know that, like you were saying, that there was a greater good. And that was the people of the town. Even though there's a town that he wanted to get out of, but still he wanted to do what was right. And that's what the soul wants to ultimately do, too. The soul wants to do what is right, even though you may have a desire in one direction, but is it the right desire at the right time? And for George, he really, he at, at a deeper level realized, if I leave, then the ship's going to sink. The person who is his nemesis, as you said, in terms of Potter, would ha own everything. And therefore, the people would be in balls and chains in some ways to, and being subservient to this particular person. He was mean-spirited. He only wanted was money. And he would have took away everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, if people couldn't pay, you would take their homes. George was not that way. It's like pay me when you can, you're good. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to to penalize you because life happens. Mm -hmm. And Potter was just the opposite. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it, you got to get out. Mm -hmm. Okay, because he would foreclose on them. But because George was that way. He made a lot of friends. He didn't realize how many friends he had and how many people cared about him and how many people prayed for him due to that fact. It gets to the point where he used his own money when there was a run on the bank. He used his own money to, to pay people off. The money that he was going to use to take his wife on a honeymoon, he used that money to give them money because their money was gone. And Potter was only going to give them pennies on the dollar. And so he used that money and helped the people to survive. But yet again, he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do with his wife, his newly minted wife. 
But she was right there with him. And, you know, he found a woman who was able to assist him in his endeavors. Instead of harping on him and saying, no, not that money's for us. We are supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. She said, no, use this. Just the honeymoon. Which was the honeymoon money. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time as life moves on and goes on. So he has a family. He has a family now. Kids, yeah. kids, family and kids. Those family, I mean, family changes things too. You would think the family would want him to settle down a little bit more, but nah, he still had those desires of he wanted to travel. He wanted to get out of Bedford Falls. But his wife was saying, no, I like this house. I don't need to, I've been out there. I don't need to be out there. I want to come, I, I'm coming back here because I like it here, which also helped him to settle a little bit more. Yeah, she had mm-hmm. uh, already uh, she, went out, got a college degree, and was coming back, Bedford Falls, um, and loved this particular house and always dreamed of herself being in that particular house. Uh, and that was um, something that she held within her heart. And his desire was to give her the moon. So whatever she wanted, he got for her. So she, he got her that house and they fixed that house up and they had a family in that house. Mm-hmm. That only curved his, his, I think it was more than, than a desire to travel. I think he wanted to, like I keep saying, the grass is always green on the other side and he felt like he was too big for Bedford Falls where he was instead of looking at the good points. I don't think he saw the good points of what he was doing. No, I think sometimes when we're living our life, we don't see things that other people can see that are the goodness and, and the graciousness and the um, service that we do as as clearly as other people can see. And I think he had a way of impacting people personally because of this kind heart, as you mentioned earlier, that he did have, and also this sincere desire wanting the best. And I think that he held what, at the soul level, is kind of this immaculate concept of people, this perfect view of them, seeing the goodness within them. Yeah, but part of it got on his skin. He couldn't, he could not get, he could not, after a while, it's like, yeah, no, you're just, just plain mean. You're just plain, plain, plain mean. It doesn't matter. Well, and I think that gets to, in terms of talking about Potter, it talks about we need to see things as they are as well. And so there's a pieces of, uh, individuals that they have choices to make. And some people can choose to be good in the decisions and actions that they take. And then other individuals may um, choose the kind of left-handed path, the, you know, the lower path, the path that is making uh, comparisons or um, competitiveness or wanting uh, other people to fail uh, and they want to win so much in that competitiveness. So I think that's a, a path in which making bad decisions in some regards, because if it's hurting someone, hindering someone in any way, then the person needs to stop and think, why am I doing this? And what happens is the ego persona is just looking at it and wanting to win. The ego persona is just looking at it from this perspective of, I'm going to get or you know that over there because it gives me more. And that greediness, you know, takes place and that pulls the soul down. That actually becomes like a weight around the soul. And so the soul can come go into dormancy. It can dormant. And so the ego persona is ruling the roost and not the soul sensitivities. Because one of the things we see with Potter, he's not sensitive about people anything. or anything. You know, he even had his assistant that kind of, because he's in a wheelchair driving around and that assistant has become the same way of this hardness, you know. That he has to be at. able to work with Potter, otherwise Potter would crush him. But it gets to the point that you know his his uncle is boasting about his nephew, who's now considered a national hero, due to boasting, talking to Potter, not paying attention to what he's doing, takes his newspaper, and when he gives it back. He wraps his mo- own, the money that he's supposed to be put in the bank in with the newspaper that is given back to Potter. So pa- he gave Potter $8,000 and couldn't remember he did it. 
Correct. But then when he was boasting about that newspaper that Potter brought in, it was just because of the nephew having yes. national recognition and was you know, kind of trying to rub it in his face yes. in some regards. Yes. And so that level of ego was competitive against his ego. Um, and so he's got so wrapped up in his desire and wanting to prove, look how great my nephew is, that he w- even didn't think about him having money uh, that he was in the a bank to deposit in his hand. He didn't even think about what he was doing uh, because he was so much um, boasting about his nephew. So when he got up to the window to put the money in, it's like, uh, what, are you, what are you going to, what are you doing? He says, I want a deposit. He says, "What the, the teller says, well, where's the money? He couldn't remember what he did with the money. That, to me, is, is outplaying, outpicturing ego and not being aware of what you're doing at the time because now Potter has it. And, you know, if Potter was a nicer person, he would have said, hey, I think this is yours. You gave me something that shouldn't be in my newspaper. He didn't do that. He didn't even mention that he had the money. The uncle is running around and they're being audited because the tax man comes to the to, to the saving and loan. And now they're $8,000 in a hole and can't explain why. Because they shouldn't be. I mean, the first thing the tax man says, you had a good year. It's like, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm not, you know, they couldn't answer that question. Because they don't know where the money is. And so now George's fears and anxieties really come full circle because now he's thinking, you see, I'm not good enough. I've never been good enough. I've never been able to do this, this, and this, and all the things that he wanted to do. All the dreams that he has come flooding back, and he's done none of them. He's still stuck in the same place that he was stuck in before. I mean, when he was a child. And now he's he's uh, worse off than he was before. So when he gets to that point, and this is around Christmas time too, now he's he thinks he's going to jail. His family, he goes to Potter. He goes back to Potter. Goes back to for, for 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 help for assistance. It's like what makes you think Potter is going to assist you when he's been after you and writing you all this time. Because the soul always thinks that the person is going to help at some level, because that's what he is. That's what he um, would have done. He would have done in helping. But not all individuals are that way in the choices they make. And Potter has consistently made these choices that have been down in terms of energy Mm. or in terms of decisions or helping. He doesn't think about helping. That's like foreign to him. Do you have any collateral? He says, I have a life insurance. He says, what's the equity on the life insurance? He said $500. Potter laughed at him. You asking me for $8,000 and you have a life insurance that's worth only five? You're better off dead. That's where he put, he plants the seed in George, that his family will be better off without him. And due to that fact, that's like kicking something when I, the man is already down. And then you kick him again and again. So he's saying, why am I here? What am I doing? Why am I working so hard? Why am I pushing so hard? Maybe he's right. Maybe I would be better off dead. And maybe my family would be better off without me too. Which becomes exacerbated by the fact that he goes to the tavern. Yes. And drinks. Yes. And gets drunk. Alcohol does not help much. I mean, to the fact that when he goes home and he's so frustrated that he's snapping at his wife and his kids. His now his daughter is sick because the teacher gives her a flower. And so the girl didn't want to, uh, to crush the flower. So she didn't close her coat. So now she's sick. So now he's really upset because it's like, what are you doing to my child? I don't need any doctor bills. I can, I, I can't pay any. I'm already in trouble with money. And now we got another issue. So then it's like he gets on the phone. His wife is talking to, to the teacher and it's because the teacher's worried about her. And he goes off on the teacher. What did you do to my child? Why did you give her a flower? What's wrong with you? Why are you sending her home half-dressed? What's wrong with you? Is our taxpayer money doing all this? It just goes off on the teacher. 
And so the husband says, he gets on the phone. Gets on the phone and says, "You, you, I want to meet you somewhere because I want to beat you up." And so he says, "Come on!" And they both hang up. And the wife gets back on trying to apologize to to the teacher, but he storms out, leaving the kids wondering, "Mommy, what's wrong with Daddy? Should we pray for him?" Mother says, "Yes, we need to pray for him." Not saying why, because she doesn't understand why either. But the then, kids are so precious because they, and then the one oldest says, "Should we pray for them?" And then the, and when they says yes, she goes, and then the other child says, "Me too. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it too. Pray for it because the the voices of children, God hears so purely in many regards, and that was a lovely scene of how, regardless of whether uh, Mary knew, which is the wife knew what was going on. She knew there was something desperately wrong because he's not that had this type of temperament. This is not him. him that was taking because he was so much. And this is the issue that goes on with the soul sometimes when we have these hardships or difficulties or events that happen to us, we get discouraged. And it not discouragement. It really feels as if there's no hope. No, it always it feels as if there is no way out in, in any way. And it can also feel as if, you know, you're suffocating. And all that together, you know, feels like he wants to pop. So he runs out, you know, out of the house. And he first apologizes though. Before yeah. he leaves, he gives to each one because of the kindness, and this is the soul. The kindness and the sensitivity of his soul realizes that wasn't right what I did, regardless of what's going on for me personally. You know, that's not right. You know, so he apologized to Mary and he apologized to each of his ch- um, children for his um, behavior that he was acting. But he's still in a great amount of hurt and despair about the situation, about what's occurring with the savings and loans. So the, the the thing is, is that he's not only is he hurt and frustrated, but he's scared because he also thinks he's going to jail for something that he did not do. When he goes out and he dro- and he goes to the tavern and he gets drinks too much, but that drink also makes him make a prayer. He makes a prayer. Now that prayer. He's not sure if it's heard or not because he's not a praying man. It says he's not a praying man. But then when the tavern owner says, George Bailey, the man sitting next to George says, which, which, which Bailey? And they said, George Bailey. Oh, he was like, he was living. He says, you made my wife cry for an hour. <laughs> and he socks someone. But this is a first testament to George because the owner of the tavern says, you hit my friend. Get out. The man says, I want to pay for my 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 beer. He says, no, get out. Okay. I never come, I back. Never come back. Oh, he tells the bar um, assistant, he never come back to my place. <laughs> He's, no, he is barred from here. That's the first sign of friendship. Of the townspeople. Yes, definitely. And then, but George does not see that because he leaves before he t- he hears what the tavern opener says, that the man does not come back. And now he's driving and he runs to a tree and the man runs out and say, what? Instead of saying, are you okay? He said, what did you do to my tree? <laughs> it's like, but I mean, that's also kind of the callousness of people too. Um, people have a tendency not to, they want their own thing, but they if somebody does something, never check to see if the person's okay. George gets out and he walks, and he walks to a bridge, and he's contemplating jumping off that bridge. And this is in winter, so it's snowing. It's cold. It's cold. And he is thinking about jumping of that bridge because of the despair, you know, that he's feeling. And feeling as if he's not worth anything, as you but said he, earlier. But he, he also has Potter in his bed. 
of Potter saying that you're worth more dead than alive. Mm -hmm. And that's and he swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. Usually, people can brush that off and say, "Wait a minute, no, that's not that's all right." But he is so low that he accepts that. And so here comes Clarence. Clarence is a is an angel, a goofy angel, but he's he's kind of cute, you know. And he's watching he's watching George contemplating jumping off a bridge. And he looks like he's thinking, how can I help this guy? They've sent me down here to help him, and I want to get my wings because I'm second class. I want to become first class. So I want to get my wings. So how can I help him? So what he does, he says, okay, I'm an angel. I'm not going to feel that water. Let me jump in and have him save me. And at least he'll get wet, but he'll see how cold it is, and he'll, I'll give him something to do. So he jumps in and screams, just flailing. He's on his back, just letting his horse fly. Help! 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 And here comes George. George sees him, takes off his jacket and uh, or coat and jumps in. Now, most people would not, in that cold water, I don't know if I would take my coat off, but he jumps in. And so he, he's helping Clarence and Clarence is... You know, and all of a sudden, Clarence just stops and it's like, okay, take me to shore type thing. <laughs> it was so cute. So they get to shore and now they're in the, ah, gosh, what was that place? He's like a, a, a security guard for the bridge. For the bridge, right. Yeah. And he's letting it get warm and trying to dry their clothes off. Now, the look on his face when Clarence says that he's an angel, it's mm -hmm. like, what? Nah, I didn't just say that. No, it's like what is he wearing? And meanwhile, he's Clarence is still busy talking to George and saying, you know, how he saved him and why he saved him. But George doesn't, doesn't believe it. George doesn't believe it. You know, it does and, bring up the notion too. I think there are angels that are here to assist and help us, mm -hmm. um, and some are you know brought through us to our prayers, as happened with George. And sometimes they take, I think, in physical embodiment, just to serve and help humanity and, and in a very selfless way. And people sometimes can't understand or can't mm -hmm. take the fact that there's actually an angel? Really? Nah. Mm -hmm. it's kind You're of crazy. Yes, yeah, with that misbelief or disbelief. Mm -hmm. A non-belief. Non-belief. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so those who walk a spiritual path, there's usually more of a belief that there are ways in which God intervenes and steps in our life to try to support and help us, even in the most difficult times that that's happening. And that what George did in that bar was the opening invitation for God to actually take a step into his life. But and when he said about, he says, Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, as you said before, if you were up there, show me the way. Help me. Mm -hmm. That Help opens me. the door. That opens the door for the angels to step in because we live on a planet of free will. And only by our asking can God say, okay, I can help you. I can step in. But if you don't ask, God says, you're saying you want to do all by yourself. And there are many people who do want to do it by, by themselves. But and those, that's what gets them in trouble. Mm -hmm. And But those who are walking a spiritual path realize that we do have assistance. We do have help. And it's a degree of humility that is required to be able to ask for that help. And that's what George had. He had a great degree of humility. That's why he didn't know how much he was worthy before the eyes of the, uh, his community, you know, that were false, and also in the eyes of God. So due to that fact, he says to Clarence, I wish I was dead. And Clarence says, no, 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 no. You never want to wish that. And then he changed it to, I wish I was never born. Clarence says, wait a minute. No, you don't want that either. Whoa. Hmm. That's a thought. That might work. Because he says, this might be a little tougher than I thought. I think it's going to be. But that 
might work because now I can show you what life would be like if you were never born. What would happen to this community if you were never born? What would happen to your family and your brother if you were never born? And through that act of taking away the idea of not being born as now, George remembers everything, but nobody remembers him. Because he's never born. He's never born. And that's the same thing that happens with souls who want to be born into this world, that they want to make a difference. And that maybe our lives would have been totally different if all these souls, you know, who had, you know, were born into the world, what, how would that make a difference? But go mm -hmm. ahead. Let's go back to your story. So due to that fact, now he's, now they go back out and Clarence is showing George how life is because he's never been born. He starts off with, I need a drink. We're going to go get my car. Clarence goes up to where his car was left. George says, where's my car? He says, George. Clarence says, George, you don't have a car. You have never been born. Huh? Okay, so then they walk to the tavern. Now his friend, the Italian guy, is not the owner. The bartender is now the owner. And very brusque and very belligerent and rude and... It's like, tell me what you want. When Clarence couldn't make up his mind, it's like, look, man, I got, I don't have time for this. Tell me what you want. So when Clarence said Mullen Spice Apples Cider or whatever, the guy says, I only sell hard liquor here. Uh, the men, people who come here want to get drunk and get drunk fast. George is looking at him like, what happened to you? Who are you? You're not my, you're not the person that I know. Clarence says, you were never born. This is somebody else's establishment, not your friend's. And it goes on like that, to the fact that he's never been born. He's walking around. Even the police officers and the friends of cabbies and people who he feels knows him don't know him. Even Violet, oh, she's so cute, who's always flirting with him, didn't know him. When he sees Mary, his wife, who was now an old maid, as they put it, screams and runs away from him. It's like, what's going on? You know me. I'm your husband. And she's like having fainting spells. The thing is, is due to that fact, people, he realizes that, wait a minute, all these people that I know don't know me. I'm, I'm truly alone. I want my life back. I want my life back. Because I want my family back. I want my wife back. He realizes that family and, and his wife are the ultimate thing for him. And I think that's the same thing that happens to our soul. Our soul wants to know that you are aware of it. That it's not invisible. That it's not, not there. Because we all have a soul. And our soul does have a purpose. And sometimes we get disconnected from that. And I think George, through not having a life, quote unquote, because Clarence taking it away, allowed him to see the value, you know, of his life. And, you know, this is a good point for us to do a cliffhanger to talk about some other pieces of this in part two that really ties into how our awareness of the significance that we bring to our, our in, all individuals we come in contact with and the significance that we do things lovingly and kindly, all that impacts the soul's evolving and growth and development and advancement. As we've been talking about, It's a Wonderful Life shows you how our ability to serve, to give, to do things selflessly, all come together to have a unique and wonderful life. So um, we're going to end here. Thank you, Christy. And we're going to come back around for part two to talk more about this. So stay, stay tuned. Bye for now.
Thank you for joining me for this episode on Mastering Life's Adventures, being your best self through soul evolution. If you have enjoyed what you've heard today, I would be delighted if you would share this episode with others. Leave a thumbs up and subscribe to my Mastering Life's Adventures podcast. Look forward to your joining the next episode. Please leave any comments or suggestions you might have below. Bye for now.